Hello and welcome to In the Envelope, an awards interview podcast. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, the most trusted name in casting. I'm here to spotlight some of the most exciting film, television, and theater awards contenders working today. Who is in the running? What makes an awards-worthy performance? And what, dear listeners, are the secrets to giving one? We're sitting down for intimate, inspirational interviews with actors and artists to get that insider's perspective on these questions and more. It's an opportunity for some of today's most talented stars to share their craft and career advice, and maybe, just maybe, provide a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. I personally believe the first win you have when you decide to be an artist or an actor or a writer or director is you get to join the circus. And that's the most beautiful part about this whole thing is the people you work with and people you get to rub elbows with and get inspired by. And it might be the lighting designer at your first theater that just Mm -hmm. gets you going. Or maybe it's the director or maybe it's another actor or whatever. But you are in the circus and that's a beautiful, weird, wonderful place to be. What a, what fun. Oh, this was wow. booked not that long ago, so I wasn't sure it was going to happen. Yeah. And I was telling the guys at Lotus, um, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't admit this, but like I I have my little notebook with the notes and I did, you know, I did the prep. I did the prep of um, you write down some questions, you write down some pointers. I, sometimes I, I do the little notebook as like a little bit of a um, life story almost, like pointers from their life or their career. But I didn't prepare that much in terms of that. Hmm. In terms of consciously doing the homework of getting ready to at, prepare like 18, here's like 18 beautiful, clear questions for this interviewer. I don't do that as much anymore. And for John Krasinski, I did very little of that. <laughs> what I did, I think, was what I was telling them. I, w- I was preparing for this subconsciously. I've pre- pre- been preparing that for this subconsciously right. for a long time. Okay. I think that John Krasinski is one of those people where like, in the back of my mind, I have thought, if I ever got to talk to him, I would probably ask him about this. Yeah. Or like, I would really want to gush about Emily Blunt, obviously. <laughs> Let's, That's not a leap for you to make, get is the, it? <laughs> <laughs> we just get the elephant in the room out of the way of like, we definitely talked about, we definitely gushed about Emily Blunt. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that's okay, right? That's I totally okay. fine. I wasn't too much. No. Okay. No, I would do the same. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. And because I... Cause I a listener of this, of this podcast that might know that she's one of my favorite people and actresses. And for those who don't know, she's married to, to John Krasinski. Yeah. So, but yes, we struck a good balance of like, I was joking that it could have been like just an hour of us talking about Emily Blunt and therefore not really about John Krasinski, but it was not that, right? Like it was a good balance. Yeah. I mean, it was okay. like 10 minutes at the end. So you don't have That's to worry That's the about way to that. do it. That's okay. fine. This is good. Okay. What else happened? What What did you think? What did we talk about? I don't remember. Well, it just I mean, happened. It just happened. And honestly, I think it was kind of a masterclass in the approach Ooh. an actor should take mm-hmm. and uh, the way they should view their career at any stage, from day one to when you're working. At any stage. I, I just love that. I mean, you'll hear it. He'll, he'll verbalize it in a much more eloquent way than I, mm. I could possibly. But I loved his approach when he was starting out and how that is – been consistent through to today Mm. and how Mm. he applies that to writing and directing as well Mm -hmm. um yeah how it's all of a piece constantly pushing the envelope constantly getting into Mm -hmm. uncomfortable situations yes um and the point that he makes throughout this interview is that success doesn't guarantee future success which that was a good point and and i've (laughs) <laughs> my very limited <laughs> amount of success that I've had, but sure. I've absolutely noticed that myself, that you get mm-hmm. a good gig and you think, right, this is it. This is my ticket to the big time. Yes. It doesn't doesn't work out like that at yeah. all. Yeah. And of course, yeah. he he had such a, an iconic role in such an iconic yes. show mm-hmm. that in some ways the he office, was actually hamstrung by wondering. that. Yeah. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. Did you watch The Office? I did. Oh, very much so. Yeah. Yes. I watch it about so. once a year. <laughs> oh my god oh really really, really. I'm a bit of a geek yeah. the American version oh yeah the British yeah. as well yeah no. and, well, I've never seen the I loved version. I loved the British version when it came yeah. out I was in the UK at the time oh yeah um, but 
beyond the first season. Why do you season, keep coming back to the office, the American office? Do you? Like I don't know. It? It's just my happy place. Yeah, you know, that's it's like great. a happy place show. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you've got these sort of you know, stalwart shows that you know you can come back to and just like absolutely always enjoy them. That um, is one of the yeah. For me, that's that show. It's just the first season of the U.S. Office is mm -hmm. very much a, a almost a remake of the U.S. U U.K. Office, right? Um, but from season two onwards, it diverges it's to be own. its own thing. Yeah, and it totally knows what it is. Yeah, exactly. It's got its own identity. It's it's not trying to be a British thing. Right. It's America, an American workplace. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, You've and got I love Steve that. Carell giving a masterclass in every single episode. Yes, all of them. It's all an ensemble. It's such a beautiful ensemble show. Yeah, no, and and I we I'm glad that he talked about that and he expressed um, he made it clear like of course he loved he loved every minute of the office mm -hmm. and it gave him so many tools or it gave him the ability to take the next success. Uh, he did talk about like the phone didn't ring right after the office, yeah. but you then have to do the thing of really really hard work. Mm -hmm. We talked about that a lot, and luck needs preparation and all of that. And and the the fact that like, for some people on this podcast, they've they've had a, a role that's really iconic and that they're most known for, and then everything they do afterward is meant to be the opposite of that or meant to kind of diverge from that. And his answer to that was it was partly that, but it was more like about everything he takes on is about getting in touch with that something really pers the really personal connection to the work and to why you do the work in the first place. Yeah. Like, why is he an artist? And I love that we got to boil that down to, like, his time at Brown and his time at the National Theater Institute at the Uni Eugene O'Neill Theater Center. Mm. Um, that, like, childlike sense of play, but also, like, having your mind blown open by all this amazing art and, yeah, the writing, directing, and acting of it all and the fact that you have to work really, really hard. Like, that all happened for him. He had such a um, an artistic awakening, and I loved yeah. hearing about that. And it sounds like that, is what has driven him throughout his really varied career. His career's been all over the place. Yeah. And it is a mistake to just think of him as Jim Halpert on The yeah. Office because, oh my God, this is his third feature film that he's directed, but he's also written a ton. He's also provided the ideas for a ton of stuff. He's an excellent producer. And the, the third film I'm talking about is A Quiet Place, which we mm -hmm. talked about in depth. Yes. A Quiet Place was a huge hit, mm -hmm. a huge unexpected hit. Yeah. People came to see that movie in droves. It mm -hmm. was uh, like Paramount Pictures' biggest hit in years. Mm. And it is a horror movie, for sure. It's in that genre. Yeah. Um, John Krasinski had some really great things to say about genre itself and like mm. what that means for filmmaking. And he'd certainly never, he's never even acted in anything horror, let alone directed and written. Or watched. For horror. Apparently. Or apparently watched. <laughs> which, I tell you, I can relate. Yeah. Quiet Place was hard for me. I don't yeah. see a lot of horror and I... For those who haven't seen it, though, I, I really think you should because it is it is a movie, as he, as John pointed out, it's about a family and it's a it's a metaphor for family and about that story. And it's a it's heartfelt in that way. And it asks the question of like, how much would you how far would you go to protect your family mm. in the most dire circumstances? In the case of this film, the circumstances are an extraterrestrial. We, we think this race of creatures that hunts sound. Mm. They're blind, but they hunt sound and they kill. <laughs> they jump and they leap and they kill people that make sound. And it's freaking scary. Yeah. And um, that makes for essentially a silent movie. Like there is maybe eight lines of dialogue total in this movie. It stars John Krasinski and Emily Blunt. Have we mentioned Emily Blunt yet? Just a few times. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's it's got just sensational performances and sensational writing and directing. And I really liked hearing about it. About He's been talking about it for months. <laughs> yeah. But... He had some really great things to say about it. And the fact that there was so, so, so little dialogue meant he had to mm -hmm. rethink challenge. how he was going to tell the story. And yeah. I thought that was interesting how he would, you know, yeah, you talk about allegory and, and things like that. And, yeah. And how mm. things represent other things. And mm -hmm. there is more depth to, I mean, he was talking about Jaws and E.T. Yeah. E and, and films like that. And yeah. we often look down on those, I think, a little bit at these totally. blockbustery kind of horror style right. films forgetting that you know there's a whole cultural history of scaring people with literal like monsters, a surface but, level yeah, yeah but representing you know things more more personal and, and i think that's why they like linger in your memory and they remain yeah. classics and they 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 speak to you more than i mean he talked about how he used kramer versus kramer as an example of like that's a movie about divorce but yeah. if you, you if you do divorce in a comedy or in a horror genre that actually feeds you the lesson not lesson but the like 
it holds up a mirror to society or holds up a mirror to you in a way that I think affects you more. I think in some ways you'll allow it in <laughs> or yeah, it'll, it it'll get its way in, in without you, yeah. exactly, without you uh, necessarily allowing it. Right. And maybe the reason you're going to the movie is because you're like sound seeking creepy creatures. Wow. That's that sounds like a fun titillating time or whatever, or the, yeah. or the shark and jaws. It's like that is the hook of the movie, but it's also a metaphor. It's also like but a tool in the filmmaker's quest to, yeah. to tell like a real authentic story. Mm. And I loved hearing about how this is a really personal project for John and for Emily both. It really is reflected in their performances. I keep coming back to, and he talked about the iconic scene where she has to give birth in complete silence. <laughs> um, and I loved hearing about um, getting on set with her because he's never directed his wife. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when, the way he described, which listeners will hear shortly the way he described which is the, pretty spoiler free iconic pretty spoiler free. scene I'm, yeah I, totally that that sent a shiver down my spine yeah. when he was talking about <laughs> what happened when he yelled cut yeah totally um, yeah oh see now we're creating our own suspense yeah. for this interview <laughs> yeah. we should i don't want to sure. give too much away yeah let's have listeners listen in um on this amazing interview with john krasinski Okay, here we go. This episode is brought to you by Participant Media and DreamWorks Pictures' Green Book, starring Academy Award nominee Viggo Mortensen and Academy Award winner Mahershala Ali as two men from different backgrounds who form a lasting friendship during the journey of a lifetime. Green Book is the winner of the People's Choice Award at this year's Toronto International Film Festival. For your SAG Awards consideration in all categories, including Outstanding Performance by a Cast in a Motion Picture. John Krasinski is best known for his role as Jim Halpert in The Office, which earned him two ensemble SAG awards. He has worked as an actor in Leatherhead's Away We Go, It's Complicated, 13 Hours, as a writer on Promised Land and Manchester by the Sea, and director and star of Brief Interviews with Hideous Men, The Haulers, and now the Paramount Pictures horror hit A Quiet Place, in which he stars opposite his wife, Emily Blunt. He also currently produces and stars on the Amazon thriller series Jack Ryan, which means he's having quite the year. Here it is, our chat with John Krasinski. I have all the fluids I need. Yeah. How's your health? Well, hopefully better after all these fluids. How's your... <laughs> Good. Yeah. Do you have to... Um, are you taking care of yourself? How busy are you? Very busy right now, but again, it's one of those things where you can't you can't complain about being busy. It's sure, good. or maybe you can, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't. Depends on how you do it. I okay, feel like, I feel like an ass if I complain <laughs> that I'm busy. Uh huh. People are like, yeah, that's what you wanted, you jerk. Yeah, but it's that thing of like, mm, this thing I envisioned that I wanted, but like, is it how I envisioned it? Right. Well, no, it's absolutely how I envisioned it. It's also just one of those things where. There isn't enough time in the day, so I've been shooting mm-hmm. the show every day on the during the week, right and now. Then, mm-hmm. And then I fly. This is the first, or no? I fly. I've been flying every weekend to L.A. for press and Savannah for press. And oh my god! Which gosh. has been amazing talking about this movie, but it's. And then you get back and you do the show. And okay. Did you expect? Wait. Did you expect for a quiet place to be doing press in November? No. Like the rest of the year? No, no way. way. No. You didn't budget didn't that into your any, schedule. No, yeah, did not. That's did amazing. Not. Yeah, but I'm also so blown away that we're even doing this. Absolutely. Yeah. Is part of the busyness? Are you working on the sequel? <laughs> Talk about the yes, sequel. Yes, I'm writing the sequel right now. <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah. What Which can I you didn't tell think us? I'd be doing. Um, I can't tell you anything <laughs> because they'll <laughs> shoot me dead. Um, no, it was one of those things Who's where. Who's they? Um, I I had I wasn't gonna do anything with the sequel. I right. thought the. the there, to me, there was no sequel. This was the movie. It wasn't like a prequel or anything. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then I said, go find another filmmaker and another writer and have fun. And hmm. I totally understand the business. I'm a realist, so I try to understand everything from everybody's mm-hmm. perspective. And I was like, yeah, totally. It's a big hit movie, so go do that. That's certainly not what our intention was. Mm-hmm. And then the producer asked me while they were meeting all these people, he said, you know, is there anything that you can think of to guide the idea because it is your baby, so maybe you want to guide sure. it. And I said, well, there was this one idea I had. And then like three weeks later, he was like, if you had any more ideas, can you keep thinking about it? And so I did. And he completely tricked me into... They're drawing you yeah, in. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Like, Do you want to write it? Just write it. Just write it. You don't have to direct it. Just write it. And I'm like, all right. 
So yeah. now I'm writing this, the sequel. And you could get even further involved, for all we know. For all we know, okay. yeah. But I don't know. I mean, it's it's got to be good first. So, Sure. Well, I like that you said you're a realist, because it sounds like you want to be realistic about uh, where something like that could go, but you're tempted and tempted because it's it's a great... It's such a great thing. People yeah, really for me, it was it was actually the reason why I decided to do it because I had talked about it with Emily too, and I was like, you know, should I do this? And she said, you know, if you don't want to, don't do it. Mm-hmm. And then I told her my idea, and she was like, you have to do it. It's really, <laughs> it's really good. Really? Like, yeah. Oh, that's that's exciting. So it's just fun because it's it's one of those things where very rarely do you get to create a world. You know what I mean? Like writing a story yeah. is really fun, but to create a world. There's, there's a lot of boundaries in that world, and you get to explore a lot more territory, mm-hmm. you know? So that was what was the draw for me, and we'll see how that goes. Yeah. Well, and it sounds like I, I went to a, um, a Q&A after a screening that you guys did, and you talked and you said some wonderful things about this film and about how it, like, be, how it became kind of yours. And Emily said the same thing for the first one where she, when you described what you would do with the script, she yeah. said, oh, you have to do this and you have to direct. Yeah, and you have to direct. Yeah. yeah. So it was a spec script that I got – sent as an actor to play the lead as role as the okay. to play the father so the, i was about to shoot season one of jack ryan mm-hmm. and we were in pre-production of that and i was talking to these producers these producers were at platinum dunes this guy drew form and brad mm-hmm. fuller the nicest guys and they said um jack ryan jack ryan jack ryan and then they said mm. you know we have this genre script that would you ever want to be the lead in a genre script and i said guys right away i'm going to tell you no no like, there's just no yeah. way i can't do genre i've never been able to watch it i'm such a scaredy cat same, yes. Yeah, can't do it. Yeah. And never have. I mean, Freddy Krueger ripped my life apart, literally. So I just, oh. yeah, I was just like, no thanks. And they said, no, 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 that's not what this is. It's it's actually a really great idea. And mm. it's about a family that can't talk. And you have to figure out why. And I thought, damn it, that's a really good, good one-liner. Right that's a really good premise. The, it's the one line. That, the one line, yeah. That's good. That one line, yeah. yeah. So then I read the spec script. And these writers had done such a great job of, I mean, the idea was fantastic. Mm-hmm. The script, I wanted to go in a very different direction, but the idea and some of the elements in there were phenomenal, and I wouldn't be here without that. That said, to me, the reason why I jumped in is because I didn't see it as a a genre movie. I saw it as a family drama. Mm -hmm. If I could could rewrite it, I said I would actually write the experience I'm going through because Emily had just had our second daughter three weeks earlier when I got the script. And so to me, I've... I've always wanted to write a love letter to my kids, and I thought, oh, my God, this is this is my opportunity to do that. As crazy as it is looking at the poster, you're like, does this guy have a problem? Like, this is his love letter his to his family? kids? His family? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, it really is. It was something really powerful and very, very deeply personal in a way that I didn't think any script would be able to hit me, rather, let alone a genre script. You know right. what I mean? And it is one of the beautiful things about genre that I'm now learning because, of course, once I decided to direct this, I um, – I've seen absolutely everything. Which you had to brush been, up. Yeah, I had to brush up mm-hmm. um, and watched most of it under the covers of my bed. Mm-hmm. But um, but no, it was it was one of those things where Drew Goddard, who's a, a good friend, he was one of the only people, if not the only person, who read the script. And he's directed Cabin in the Woods and, and recently Bad Times at the El Royale and wrote and directed those. Mm. And he said something about genre that's so interesting, which is – I'm probably paraphrasing, and he said it much more elegantly. But he said, you know um, – Genre is a really beautiful tool because it allows you to keep the the audience the audience actually gets to keep the movie at an arm's length, and so therefore they're uh, more willing to experience certain stuff because there's a distance. And I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "Well, you know, if you're a child of divorce and you're watching Kramer versus Kramer, that is way too in your face. Maybe totally, that's too mm. difficult to deal with. Mm-hmm. But if you do a genre movie about divorce, like E.T., which is all oh, about divorce, yeah. you're cool you're willing to go into this movie and really delve into this stuff and kind of mm. realize that it's a metaphor for, you know, divorce mm-hmm. rather than be hit on the head with it. And I went, man, that is one of the smartest things I've ever heard. That was so smart. And yeah. it's exactly what this movie is. To me, this is a movie, like I said, this is a love letter to my kids. This is about parenthood mm-hmm. and the fears of parenthood and that terror of letting your kids out into the world, into the darkness where there are quote unquote metaphorical creatures. Mm. It's It's that idea of, what would you really do for your kids? You know, mm. the mm-hmm. if you're challenged with what would you do for your kids and you're like, well, I'm going to, you know, get them into school and, you know, <laughs> pay for their food. And they're like, no, no, no. What would you really Survival. do for your kids? Yeah, 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 it's, yeah, it's really a question that I've always sort of wanted to explore. Yeah, I'm. that's so interesting, the thing about genre, because I had thought of it more in terms of horror. Like my understanding of horror film or horror filmmaking and that kind of thing 
has changed and evolved, and I am a newbie, and I do have to watch things under the covers. Right, right, right. But it's like um, you, it's a mirror. It's like a uh, funhouse mirror where yes. you can see society or you can see exactly. yourself. And the me- and the message or the like right. the metaphor or whatever, it goes down easier because you're like slipping it in. Exactly right. That's exactly right. And the funny thing is, is the first thing I learned when I did delve into all this genre, as soon as I decided to direct it, like I said, my iTunes list is... It's horrible. Very horror. disturbing. Yeah. People are just like, what is this guy's deal? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But I, uh, you realize, the first thing I realized was how ignorant I was, how ignorant I was to not be paying attention to genre because, uh-huh. at least for me, when I knew about genre, like I said, was like when I was 12 or however old I was when I watched Nightmare on Elm Street, I was like, mm-hmm. oh, this is a genre of film just to scare the living daylights out of you. No, mm-hmm. thank you. Yep. And that's not at all what it is. There, especially in the last ten years, I think genre uh-huh. is some of the best filmmaking, writing, directing, cinematography, and like you said, social messaging, hmm. or being able to deal with bigger things. Which again, I don't think is just in the last ten years. But for me, in mm-hmm. this new experience, you know, Get Out, of course, is yes. brilliant and uh, about something. So I would never have considered that a genre movie, but it is. Of course, it is. Mm-hmm. It's a social commentary on so many things but it's also so well done it's so funny it's all these things but Mm -hmm. then there's you know the witch which is one of the most beautiful movies Mm. totally terrifying you know as a catholic we Uh don't get along great with devil stuff so that was just horrifying to me um and then one of the best love stories i've seen truly one of the best love stories i've seen in the last 10 to 20 years is let the right one in the original let the right one in about uh these two children and you're just Mm. totally mesmerized by a young boy kind of falling in love with this girl who just so happens to be a vampire. And (laughs) again, you just, you leave that movie saying that was one of the best movies I've seen. It's not genre or whatever. And so that's what I was trying to do here. I, I, Mm. I, I wasn't doing the more modern thing. I really wanted our movie to feel like a throwback. So for me, the only movies that I could stomach or did stomach or, still was terrified by was the more throwback movies like Jaws, Mm -hmm. um, Alien, all the Hitchcock stuff. Um, And like Rosemary's Baby was another one for tension. But it was this Mm -hmm. idea, like you said, there was something more going on. To me, Mm -hmm. as a child, obviously, Jaws is just a shark movie. And then you watch it again when you're older and you're like, this isn't a shark movie at all. That shark, you know, without being stupidly heady, is like it's very obvious that shark is a representation of all these guys' fears that they have been trying to avoid dealing with and then it literally bites you in the ass mm-hmm. <laughs> as a 25 foot shark yeah that was really interesting to me like the to me that third act of those three guys on a boat was so poetic and like one of the best plays you could ever mm-hmm. write you mm-hmm. know and uh it just so happened that you know the bookends of that was a giant shark trying to kill them yeah like the shark is the tool it's mm-hmm, also kind mm-hmm, of the hook mm-hmm, to get mm-hmm. people to come in and see it or whatever. exactly right yeah is it true also that in terms of like making this movie more throwbacky that you had to look at like silent movies as well? It's a good question. So um, a lot of people have asked if I've watched silent movies and I actually did. Mm-hmm. The funny thing about that is those movies are devoid of sound. You, you They actually can't have sound, mm-hmm. right? So what I mean by that is I was much more fascinated or I found myself getting much more fascinated by more modern filmmakers dealing with lack of dialogue, dealing with silence. Mm. So I was you know, on touchstones of certainly visually, my two touchstones were, um, there will be blood, uh, the oh. opening of there will be blood. Obviously Paul does an oh. incredible job of whatever that is, 12 minutes or 17 minutes mm-hmm. or whatever that is of Daniel day Lewis, not speaking to anyone, just mining himself. And mm-hmm. then no country for old men where, you mm-hmm. know, uh, Josh's character, I think that's another nine, 10 minute run where he discovers that sight of the, mm-hmm. uh, shootout and then finds the guy by the tree and they, they're just constantly dealing with the stillness and silence of us as everyday people and that's what mm. i was heading into rather than yeah. oh man let's do a big trickery of sound it was like how do people deal with stillness and because this movie isn't a silent movie in fact it's very much not a silent movie it's it's the complete opposite it's a mm-hmm. sound movie mm-hmm. um and so even when these you know these characters can't speak they are very much surrounded by and almost overwhelmed by sound or the idea of sound. Yeah, like sound is sort of a character in the movie. It's the main character. Or yeah. it's the shark, yeah. Or yeah, I exactly. Guess the, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, no Country for Old Men and, and all, of these other, like, all of these other examples, when you say look at them, do you see it as like a, the director hat and the writer hat? Are they different hats? 
Or is oh, it's it all a good question. Like... Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I had I had the most amazing experience, which is, I kind of came into this whole acting thing totally by happenstance because hmm. I went to the most amazing school uh, in Brown University, and yes, it was one of the best schools in the country, educational wise. And certainly I, I'm proud to have that education, but my real education was being introduced to this whole new world. So what I mean by that is I was probably a kid for the most part who hadn't seen any movie that wasn't in the Cineplex. Mm. I hadn't really listened to anything that wasn't on the radio. Sure. And here I was mm. trying to find my identity and find my people, so to speak. And as soon as I got to Brown, I immediately identified with all these acting. I'd never really acted at all. And I identified with the theater community who were so open to everything. So my point getting back to it is like I, I just saw art was introduced to me as an explosion rather than systematic, mm. you know, plotting and planning of how to get from A to B. There is no A to B. It's just this explosion. So what I did was in, in college, I asked like seven or eight of my closest friends freshman year to give me a different album and movie that I should watch. Oh, and for cool. four years, every single week, they gave me a new movie and a new album. And huh. that is my education. That transformed me. Gotcha. No drugs necessary. My brain was ripped open. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it was just it, – it, so to your point of is it writing or directing, I just saw it as this like – Like art. Yeah, just yeah. this wave all around you. And, you know, I went hmm. to art museums for the first time as an adult. You know, I'd gone to art museums yeah. as a kid. but you don't really take it all in. And so sure. then I just started being so voracious in my appetite for anything, right? Yeah. And so when I took on this <clears throat> movie to write and direct, it was just, I was directing the second I started typing. You know, that was mm. the cool thing. It was this all-encompassing thing. I also knew that I was going to play the part. So mm -hmm. I was also probably acting at the same time or doing yeah. preparation. It was kind of this, exactly like my experience at Brown, it was just sort of this, aren't we so lucky to be doing what we're doing cool. kind of energy rather than let me split it up. So I yeah. watch movies that way too. I, I watch no country and know exactly why that script is one of the most brilliant ever, mm -hmm. but it all does kind of flood together. I mean, I think I watched the, I don't think there's a scene I've watched more than the ending of no country for old men, which is Tommy Lee Jones. That monologue. Telling, oh my God. About yeah. his dad and the dream he has. Oh God. It's oh God. so good. That came out the same year as there will be blood. I know too. what a year. And movies. the ending of there will be blood. I've never sat in a movie theater in total silence for like 10 minutes with Until everyone else. A in quiet the movie place. Theater. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, when I saw a quiet place, it was like uproarious applause. Oh, that's nice. That movie. <laughs> nice. Um, we at this, of course we're backstage. We love hearing about, that time in the life when the when your brain is like yeah. exploding. What did you say? You're um you're trying on identities almost. You're yeah, like, absolutely, yeah. And the I'm, brown I, thing. I want to hear about like after Brown two. Well, that was that was the New moment York I chose days. to be an actor. So that was my yeah. introduction to the community. And I I really only and when I say I joined the community, I mean I was like armed guard number four in plays, and I was yeah. painting sets, and I was doing whatever I could at the student theater. Which is great. But it was it was just being surrounded by the people who truly loved and actually learning from the people who truly mm -hmm. loved. I ended up graduating as a writer from Brown, and I never would have done that had it not been sort of some of these people around me who introduced me to these plays that were unbelievable. I remember reading Angels in America for the first time mm -hmm. there and yeah. being way out of my depth. I remember taking this incredible class of um, – uh, theory. It was a theory class, a theater theory class, which was, you know, run by this guy, John Amy, who, I mean, was speaking so easily about concepts that truly were giving me a headache. I mean, I was, I was mm -hmm. so far behind everybody else that I was just trying to keep up, but I was so in love with it. I was so in love with being pushed to this idea. And so I enjoyed it. I thought I was going to leave and be an English teacher. Mm. And I came into mm. Brown as a mid-year uh, which at the time they, I think they still, I don't know if they still have the program, but they used to take 30 to 40 kids in January. So instead of going in oh. the class uh, in September or August or whatever they do, they, they take another small group of kids because some people don't end up going to Brown. And so they have a couple spots oh. left open. So they had this class that was a mid-year class. So the problem was once all my friends graduated, I didn't really want to be on campus without my friends. So uh -huh. they graduated in May and I still had a semester to make gotcha. up. And out of... I mean, really sheer laziness. I had heard about this school. I was interested in it, the National Theater Institute yes. um, at Waterford, Connecticut, the Eugene O'Neill Center. Mm -hmm. I had heard about it. A couple of my friends had gone and loved it. And I thought, 
Yeah, 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 totally. I'm sure I'll love it. But the most important thing is they transfer credit. So done deal. Let's do that. For the last that. semester. Yeah, I just, I I'll be in okay. a new group of people and I don't have to be lonely on campus. And so I get there totally expecting to I, not not goof off because I really wanted to work hard. But mm-hmm. at the same time, I was like, it doesn't matter. No matter what happens in this semester, I'll I'll graduate college. That's yeah, all I know. It's final semester. Yeah. And it turned out to be the, I think it was 16 weeks or something. It was, it was the most transformative. Mm -hmm. So if Brown was introducing me to it all, this was the galvanizing moment. This was this moment where you woke up every morning at, you know, 4.30 in the morning or 5 in the morning to to get prepared and you were going to bed at 2 in the morning because Mm -hmm. this school was all about if you want to be an actor or a director or a writer, then you need to know how hard you have to work. This Mm -hmm. is not something that you may have read about or dreamt about, which is like you just sit in a room and – do monologues all day and then someone calls you and puts you in a TV show or a movie. It was like, no, 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 you have to get up every day and be working 10 times harder than everyone else because to get yourself out there, just to get to the starting gate Mm -hmm. takes so long, you know? That's perfect prep for the real world. It's exactly exactly right. So either way, I was super pumped about it, but I was transformed. There was a very definitive um, influence on me. This guy, David Jaffe, who ran the school at the time was just one of those... Uh, sort of monolithic figures for me who came in and just changed my whole life. He he basically said, if you wanted to do this for a uh, career, mm-hmm. I think you have what it takes. And I thought, wow, that's wow. amazing, right? And he had just told everybody that it is very hard to make this a career, um, mm-hmm. the difficulties and all these things. He said, but I think you, you could do it. And I said, oh, thank you so much. It was the first week. You had to meet him on the first oh. week. And I'll never forget, he said... Um, uh, I think you could. I think you can make it. You, you have some real talent. And at the time, I, like I said, I hadn't really thought about doing it. And he said, "The only question I want to ask you is, uh, when are you going to stop bullshitting yourself?" And I said, "What?" Wow. And he was like, "When are you going to stop being a bullshitter?" And I was like, "Wow, I what? never been direct addressed like that." And he said, <laughs> "I watch you in these scenes and in these monologues, and in one week I figured you out, which <gasps> is every time you are this close to getting to the truth." You bail you. and you go to comedy and you True. try to make your friends laugh. Mm. And I would ask you if trailer. you have the strength and the courage to go that extra mile and keep going and allow yourself to be hurt and allow yourself to be wrong and allow mm. yourself to fail. I think you could be something special. Otherwise, don't no even way. worry about it. Yeah. Oh, otherwise, God. just check out. It's all good. That was an intense conversation. Yeah. And I I took it on. I took on that mantle and just thought, you know what? I'll do it. I And I remember that first week after that conversation – doing i think it was either true west Hmm. or something where we were getting into some real heavy stuff Mm -hmm. and i looked out at the crowd and could feel exactly what he was telling i was aware now you know it's like when you get labeled Mm -hmm. i was aware of looking out to the crowd and being like i can make a joke and i saw him looking at me and i turned right back in and Mm -hmm. kept going and he he taught me truth he taught me search for that and from then on I, I got to say, that's what made me want to be an actor because there was something about the responsibility of being a storyteller. And if you ever get the opportunity mm. to do it, there's there's so much you can say. It's not just about performing. Mm-hmm. It's the actually responsibility. a responsibility you have to tell stories that are very important to people. And I'd never seen that. Uh, I saw acting as just kind of like, well, you're going to get paid to goof off. This is easy. It's fun. It's goofing off. It's low stakes. Yeah, yeah, low yeah, stakes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Boy, it takes a really, really good educator to to boil down <laughs> flaws. And in a week, too. I and was in like, a week. Wow. And throw it in your face. Yeah. I studied at the O'Neill, too. I know that the O'Neill has the... I was in the National Critics Institute. Oh, nice. And right it's on. two weeks of, like, you get up first thing in the morning, you're writing until... Yeah. Like, exactly right. After. And they have the Playwrights Conference, which is the same thing. Yes. Amazing. And, um, that's that's sort of the way it goes. And that place, as you know, is... There's there's magic in the air there. It's paradise. Holy Lord. There's, yeah. there's spirits and ghosts and all oh, sorts yeah. of great things O'Neil's walking with like you. Yeah. creepy ghost. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Um, I didn't realize that was your last semester. That is actually like a really great transition from Brown into the real world. Oh, like, my God. Yeah. You can't just think you're going to, yeah, graduate Brown in like the real world. If you want to maybe be an actor, yeah. maybe be a director. Just kind of dick around and yeah. like sleep in. Like, no, you have to hit the pavement. No, it was hardcore. Yeah. And they were really hard about it. They were like, you know, you had to write a play, you had to direct mm-hmm. a play, you had to do all this stuff. And I remember it was also, um, I'm probably just rambling now, but it was also no, it's great. that it's where I was for 9 11. So we oh. started on 9 9. Oh, wow. And two days into us at that school, 
9-11 happened. And I remember, obviously, it changed everybody's life. But it mm. changed our life artistically because, again, this guy, again, that's why I said he's a monolithic figure to me. It's like he, he – so we were supposed to fly. Part of the experience is you fly overseas to study either at the um, school in Moscow or it, with the Royal Shakespeare Company. Yes. At Stratford upon Avon, and so I said, you know, luckily, our, our luckily for me, I was a Shakespeare nerd. So mm -hmm. in the fall, you go to Stratford. So on 9/11, now 9/11 happens. <clears throat> we're not allowed to have radios or TVs or anything in the oh. uh, at the. You know, it's it's very uh, dedicated as boot far camp. as like, yeah, yeah, exactly boot camp. And we were supposed to leave two days later, I think, oh. uh, to fly to London. Huh. And he came up and made the most unbelievable speech. He said, um, if any of you do not want to travel to London, totally understand. I would, I would question and charge you with one question, which is, is this representative of a much bigger thing in not only your life, but life in general? That these are the challenges that if you step up and can step through, hmm. you have the ability to be great not only as artists, but as people, that if you hmm. if you stay down in these moments, are these the moments that will define you? Or if you stand up, they can never define you, and you are, you hmm. are, you're basically defeating the, the, the very purpose that those people were trying to scare you with, yeah. right? Hmm. And I was just rocked. The other thing that came out that week was that um, some supposedly churches in certain churches in New York, supposedly, I didn't know, but supposedly had closed the churches and the theater doors were always open and so that idea of your oh, church cool. being open for you was so moving and mm, so yeah so there were all these very intense things going on where mm. it felt like the universe was sort of like so this whole idea of you doing this out of laziness you should probably rethink that like this yeah. is a, this is a real this is a real question and a real gotcha. and so that's why that it responsibility became, thing. yeah and exactly it's, it's ingrained in you you haven't you've been working every day since you right yeah very hard exactly yeah yeah that's really that's it is important for those who are just starting off or those who are maybe they're just a freshman in college or whatever and they're thinking about maybe taking it on as a career. Without a it doubt. It is a responsibility. It really is. It's but epic. And listen, there's no doubt that there's luck, but the, the mm. preparation for that moment of luck, you know, I forgot what smart person said it, but, the, you know, success mm -hmm. is luck meets um, uh, preparation. And I think that that's true. I totally agree. Totally. totally. Um, what is a Sunday Night Productions, the... Could you explain the name of where, like, where did that come from? <laughs> great. That... I, I rarely get to talk about this, so that's great. So <laughs> Sunday Night is my company and um, exactly what we're talking about. So mm -hmm. when I left NTI, I moved to New York to be a professional waiter. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yay. That's what we like hearing about exactly. here. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I knew that I wouldn't be an actor first. I'd have to work at it. And so. See, you knew that. I did. Some I, people don't know that. Yeah. They No, but again, that school is just like, there's, there, yeah. you know. Could it happen? Sure. Could a comet hit you today also? Yes. Yes. Um, and I love talking about that stuff. It's so great. So every sun. So the one thing you don't get to do as a working actor, working writer, working director when you're starting out is to act, write, or direct. You have totally. to be someone's assistant. You have to, in my, in my experience, be a waiter, bartender, mm -hmm. cleaned yoga studios, like anything mm -hmm. I can do to make money, which doesn't leave a lot of time for acting. Mm -hmm. So a group of friends and I got together every single Sunday night. And that Sunday night became the only night we could talk about yeah. movies, about plays, about books, about music, and really dig deep. And hmm. weirdly, if you come to my office, I they have since closed that restaurant that we always met at. It was the Allstate Cafe oh. on the Upper West Side. And I, one night I had carved Sunday into the table, oh. and I went and got that table. And it's oh really gosh. important to me because cool. – Sunday night, the reason why it means so much to me is because, you know, for it, here, here's a, one of the things people keep asking me is like, oh, this new chapter in your career, it seems like you're running away from the character of Jim. And I said, no, oh. not at all. In fact, it's mm. quite the opposite. The opportunity that I was given with Jim was so lottery ticket life that it, it didn't make sense to me. I probably didn't feel like I deserved it. So I kept uh -huh. thinking about all those nights at the Sunday night table, and I thought, how many beer glasses did we slam down and say, if we ever get the chance, this is what we do mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. And so I literally got off the office and I said, well, I'm going to do exactly what my do friends and I promised we'd do, which is I do have that opportunity. I'm going to push the boundaries. I'm going to push my own limits and the limits of what I think can be done now. And first thing I did was take all the 
money from the um, pilot of the office and I bought the rights to brief interviews with Hideous Man, which is the okay. first thing I ever directed and yeah. adapted. And it was one of those things where you huh. you I, it just means so much to me to keep referring back to exactly what we're talking about. So I named my, co- my company after the the group of people who inspired me every single day mm-hmm. and just thought, you know, I have that opportunity now, so I'm gonna I'm gonna live by that creed and not some creed of well, I've had a success now, so I'll just sit back and do nothing with sure. it. Sure, or chasing fame, or like yeah. going in some, yeah, you're staying in touch with what initially inspired you. Well, that's the thing is when, when I first started out, everything terrified me. Every part was scary, you know, yeah. and, I, and that, cool. that felt good. That felt good to be challenged. And mm-hmm. so after doing The Office for 10 years, mm-hmm. it's not that I was running away from Jim. It's I finally had the opportunity to, as an artist, try to do different things. Yeah, and not so get to, comfortable. Yeah, not get comfortable. And I thought... If I do get comfortable, I'm pretty sure there's a direct correlation to worse work. I'll do worse work. And so if I challenge myself, hopefully I can just to that point of, you know, when are you going to stop bullshitting yourself? Like you you push Uh, yourself to that limit. Like the moment you feel, that's exactly right. The moment you feel comfortable, push it, push it farther. Yeah. Mm, Yeah. And so I, so that's what led to. 13 hours and my first play and then hmm. the hollers which i directed i yes. never would have directed if i wasn't scared out of my mind and then the hollers led mm. to this so it's yeah. a, it's like a a chain of events of putting it into the ether of like all right well we sat around a table and said we do this so i got to do it this episode is brought to you by universal pictures and dreamworks pictures first man the riveting story of nasa's mission to land the first man on the moon one of the most dangerous missions in history Starring Academy Award nominee Ryan Gosling as astronaut Neil Armstrong and Emmy Award winner Claire Foy as his wife, Janet. For your SAG Awards consideration in all categories, including outstanding performance by a cast in a motion picture. I always find it's kind of helpful to talk about type and like what people or what the industry kind of labels artists as. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like the narrative for you has often been maybe... Um, he's Jim Helpert, and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. anything he does that's not Jim is like going outside his right. his box. Whereas, like looking at really looking at your at your resume, it's a combination of like you provided the idea for Manchester by the Sea, mm-hmm. yeah. and you're very much a multi hyphenate, right. you know, whatever that means, right. as nice opposed to the the comedic actor. And like you can totally take on like a Quiet Place, having not done horror, right, and not done. This is your first like big budget. Um, yes, big, like, my production. first studio movie. Yeah, yeah studio yeah. movie. No, yeah, you're yeah. nailing it. I mean, that's exactly right, which is, again, it was all terrifying back in those brown days or that NTI days, which is everything was new. You know, like I said, <laughs> I had never read Angels. And so mm-hmm. not only was I trying to make sense of it, but I was also super intimidated by it. Like, what a tome of writing. It was like, I remember I'm those still things. Intimidated by exactly. It. Yeah. It's like, so I just wanted to stay intimidated and stay, yeah. Ooh. stay there. You know, I, I just did. And, Listen, they're, they're also, when you take those challenges, you easily could fall and mm-hmm. fail and all those things. And it just so happens that <laughs> NTI's um, motto, their yes. one line on their poster is risk, fail, and risk again. And yes. it's really what I live by. I really yes. do. And listen, it's it's terrifying. It was, it was terrifying to come off the show and, you know, uh, audition for a war movie where they said that it already cast it and all this stuff. You know, mm. it's just one of these things where... I remember my agent called and said, they've already cast it, but the casting director thinks you'd be good for it. Um, they yeah. already know who they want for it. They were two big stars. and What? And, I, <laughs> and the casting director said, but they haven't done it yet. They haven't made the offers yet. Why doesn't he just come in? Huh. And I remember I went in and, you know, again, I learned from all these tiny things. I was watching inside the actor's studio when I was <laughs> waiting tables back in the day. Mm-hmm. And I saw Ed Harris. And Ed Harris got on and somebody asked him, do you like auditioning? And he said, yes. But you're also talking to someone who's successful and is experienced and all these things. Yes. So yes, auditioning makes sense. But when I started out, did I like auditioning? No, I was terrified. Mm-hmm. He said, I remember auditioning became where I realized I had gone wrong is auditions became the potential for something else. So I would audition for a role saying, well, if I get this role, I'll pay my rent. And if I get this role, I'll impress this girl. Yeah. And if I, impre- you know, and everything had a, it was a jumping pad to something else. And he said, and I, I forgot that I was doing it just to do it. And so I realized one day these auditions are actually just three-minute plays. And the one thing, as Mm. I said, you don't get to do when you're a working actor is act. So he said, I started looking at auditions as three-minute plays. And if they didn't want me to do it, no problem. I got to perform the role once. Mm -hmm. The next day, I booked my first job ever 
after watching that. Oh, wow. And the whole Mm. point of that is I went to the 13 Hours audition literally remembering Ed Harris again. So all these years later, the show later and all this stuff, I went into the audition the exact same way instead of feeling... You know, like, oh, I'm a big deal. I was like, wow, you were mm-hmm. just told you're not a big enough deal to get the role. So if you want to right. go in there, why don't I just went in and said, I've always wanted to do a war movie because I'm from a huge military family. And I have wanted to do something that would reflect mm. all that sacrifice and all that bravery and courage. So mm. I'll just go in and do a three minute play about it. Not even thinking I had a chance. And then mm-hmm. I got the role, which was awesome. But mm. I looked at it instead of, oh, I really want to do something different than Jim. It was like, no, I just totally. want to try something. Totally. I just want to try something and I'm terrified. And and you had, it sounds like you personally connected with the, with the material. With exactly. The, well, that's, to me, hours. that's kind of the most important thing of all of it, okay. which is, you know, the, the one thing that I, I'm for, listen, like I said, I live a lottery ticket life. We're all living in a fantasy camp. There's nothing that's mm-hmm. not amazing about even being able to do this job on Without being paid. Like the fact that mm-hmm. I, I personally believe the first win you have when you decide to be an artist or an actor or a writer or director is you get to join the circus. And that's yeah. the most beautiful part about this whole thing is the people you work with and people you get to rub elbows with and get inspired by. And it might be, you mm-hmm. know, the lighting designer at your first theater that just mm-hmm. gets you going. Or maybe it's the director or maybe it's another actor or whatever. But it's you are in the circus and that's a beautiful weird, wonderful place to be. Mm-hmm. So then secondarily is taking these chances. But for me, the the greatest, I would say, opportunity that I have with any success that I've had is to now be in the position probably for the first time in my career. I mean, I'm sure people think like, well, you're on the office. You could choose whatever you wanted. That, totally not true. Sure. Mm-hmm. And another thing that's really important to, tell, to say, especially, you know, to this audience is mm-hmm. one big misconception that – I had to live through the hard way was when I got off the office, I remember all these people were telling me, man, when you get off that show, wait till you see how many offers you get. I mean, oh, it's such yeah. a huge show. Watch, watch, you'll be, you'll be, you get to do anything you want. The phone didn't ring once, yeah. not once. People like, shouldn't say soon, that. No, yeah. but exactly. But it's that, it's that idea of success leads to other success, but it's actually not true. I yeah. was trying to get, I was trying to get into auditions after the office and mm-hmm. people were like, oh no, he's, he's just Jim from the office. That's, you, 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 you are now going to be entombed in this thing, which, again, I never took negatively. Here's the thing. At the end of the day, I'm very certain that at the end of my career, Jim will still be the thing I'm most known for. That is a total honor. That is so mm-hmm. amazing. It changed my life. It changed. It, it gave me – I would not be a director, an editor, a writer, any mm-hmm. of those things without that show because mm-hmm. it was the best film school in the world. Um and that said, I I don't want to run away from it. I'm just trying to embrace these things. But it is interesting that that idea of like, oh, well, if you're on a hit show, that's how you go and keep doing other things. And it's like, no, that's actually when they tell you, like, you did it. You had your one shot. Goodbye. And oh, my so God. And so you have to fight through it, you know? Yeah. Well, I guess that's, yeah, that's uh, maybe only the arts is where that's true, where, like, success yeah. does not necessarily lead to other success. But that's what, so my whole point, sorry, I got off track, but my whole point was, when you fight <clears throat> at whatever stage you are, when you fight mm-hmm. it, the thing you fight hardest for are the things that are most personal to you, mm-hmm. which is a quiet mm-hmm. place. I mean, a quiet place yeah. again is I never wanted to do genre like we were talking about. Um, and then I saw that I read the spec script again. The idea was perfect and add some elements, but I thought, Oh my God, mm. if I could write this as the best metaphor for parenting uh, that I've ever experienced, I'll, uh, that's a success for me. And so mm-hmm. I went out writing a love letter to my kids. And it, this is the most personal thing I've ever done in my career, for sure. Emily said the same thing. Oh, really? It's like it was her most personal. This quiet place was like she's playing. I didn't realize it was so after the birth of, the, of your second child. Mm-hmm. She had just it had our second daughter. That. Wow. Three weeks. She was three weeks old when I read the first spec script. Was the giving birth in total silence part of the spec script? Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay. The idea of her being pregnant was, I mean, the way okay. we designed the set piece was all, it was all us. But the idea of her being pregnant and having to give birth quietly absolutely was there. Cool. It, was, it was about how you sort of maneuvered it. But yeah, that's what I mean. Elements of the original script are, yeah. are, were huge, were huge. But it wasn't about family on every single level. So what I did was I took every single storyline, every single detail. And mm. if it wasn't about family, I didn't use it. So for oh. instance, the sand paths. 
the sand pads are a really fun idea for sound. Mm -hmm. The reason why I had the idea was because I needed a visual way to show how dedicated the father was. So when you go to the silo and you can see that the sand pads are like a giant maze, mm -hmm. you actually see how much time he's put into his family. Okay. Because I didn't have cool. backstory and I didn't have dialogue, so I had to use yeah. visual cues. The lights, the same thing, is to show lighting all over the farm means that he's thinking, he's trying to be one step ahead. You know, right. um, mm. the idea of homeschooling because we couldn't have a scene of her actually schooling, I had to design the idea of the room and what she'd be doing. So the idea of homeschooling was the mm -hmm. idea, another idea I put in the script. And this mm -hmm. idea of my favorite dichotomy of the movie is surviving versus thriving. So my character and Emily's character are mm -hmm. polar opposites. So I've always been fascinated with loss. I've been fascinated with the strength that comes from loss. I feel like we have a superhero in all of us that when you're dealt a horrible, horrible blow, if you can access any part of that, that's mm. what makes you get through it. Yeah. And so my character, his superhero that he taps into is survivalist. He's just surviving, which mm. is I will remove all joy from my life and dedicate myself purely. And every breath that I take is mm. to protect my family and make sure they go to bed at night. And and Emily's character <clears throat> is the complete opposite. Her Her superpower is... Yes, there is loss. Yes, there is darkness in the world, but there will always be light. There will always be dawn to that darkness. And mm. we cannot allow our kids to grow up as survivalists. They have to know that they are loved and that the world is bright and that there is things to be romantic about in the world. Mm. So that's why she does homeschooling. That's why she does these cooked di dinners and meals. And that mm -hmm. barn actually has this really warm, loving, womb-like kind of mm -hmm. feel because, and then she's hanging a mobile for a baby. And the fact yeah. that she's even having the baby, it's like she's all mm -hmm. about fighting fighting, and, and, and not allowing uh, the day to just be darkness. Right. God, I hadn't read, I hadn't read that into that. That's amazing. The, um, it sounds like you're you're very into the specifically the world building part mm -hmm. of, of that, mm -hmm. and that was so much a part of the initial like script thing. But like talking about the sand pass and talking about the like the backstory to the mm -hmm. extent that it's there. Right. Is it all about like? Um, it makes me think of like J.R.R. Tolkien or something of like when you're creating a world, it's about creating rules. That's exactly right. right. Yeah, that's the scariest part, you know, is... You don't want to break your rules. You can't break one, because if yeah. you break one, then they all kind of fall apart. Mm. Uh, or you try not to break one. But mm -hmm. so, again, like the, the original script started with um, the family on the farm. Uh, there was no opening. So with I wrote the, the opening pre, of like the... Like a prequel, yeah. Yeah, the, so there was also the family had lost a child in a car accident before the aliens had arrived. Oh. And I thought, again, connect everything back to the family. So the family should all be witness to the loss. There Ooh. should be blame for the loss. There should be guilt for the loss. Yeah. There should be all these things, these family dynamics that are so rich and so complicated. That's mm -hmm. what the whole movie is about. So that's why the first thing I wrote was the opening to the movie. I also, to your point, wanted more backstory. But I wanted backstory in the questions rather than in the answers. So oh. – so, like, there's things that I wrote into the pharmacy scene where you can see that the shelves have been looted by anybody, but the things that were left behind are potato chips and anything that makes sound. Loud so there's uh, okay. there's rules in yeah. the backstory that you don't get to hear or see, but mm -hmm. if you're paying attention, you, you get to see that. Mm. And then the coolest thing, one of my favorite experiences of the whole movie was designing my character's sort of basement, you know, um, his workshop, you know, his, his – uh, it, it, the the whole backstory of the movie is on that one wall. Oh yeah. So yeah, in yeah. all his research, yeah. and we get, you get a glimpse. To see it. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. And so I wrote the whole backstory. I know where they come from, what day, how this all mm. happened, how fast it went. But I <clears throat> actually decided not to use it because when I wrote Promised Land with Matt Damon, mm -hmm. we went into Focus Features to have this amazing marketing meeting, and the guy who was running marketing at the time there was Jack Foley. He's this amazing guy, mm. great guy, Boston guy, had the best accent I've heard, <laughs> um, and he. Uh, we went through the whole marketing meeting, and as I was leaving, because I've been so fascinated with the whole uh, business and every facet of it, I said, you know, what's the one thing, what's the biggest misconception in this business? And without hesitation, he said that the audiences are stupid. They are not stupid, and they mm. do not want to be spoon-fed. They want to be challenged. You can challenge them more. Mm. All these great things. Cool. And I thought, when I was writing this, I thought, Jack, you better be right. So I took out the entire backstory <laughs> and thought, the reason why I did it was... If I take out the backstory, then you don't know what's going on. 
And the father in this family barely knows what's going on. Mm. And so you're now with them. You're now emotionally connected to them. Tension-wise, you're feeling the tension that they are because you don't know anything. Mm -hmm. It actually allows you to be with the family. And if you knew what had happened with some, you know, scene showing it all happen. Sure. Then you're now disconnected from the family because you know more than they do. And if you know more than that Mm -hmm. family does, then you won't care about them nearly as much. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's where it all came from. And there's a mystery element too, where like we don't know what their alien, what the alien's weakness is. Exactly. Are they even aliens? I mean, they are. I mean, well, they're technically from another planet, so I think that's an alien. But um, yeah. But yeah, I always called them creatures because it was this Mm. this really fun idea. And designing them was, I mean, outrageous. It was so much fun. Um, Yeah. The this this guy, how it happened was we got ILM. We were really lucky to get ILM to mm-hmm. jump onto this movie, which was phenomenal. They and did we had, um, Jurassic Park, and is they've that, done pretty much everything, everything. from from yeah. from the original Star Wars to um, Jurassic Park to uh, 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 I'm trying to think. I mean, literally every major world building they've they've done. Mm-hmm. Um, other than I'm, I'm sure a, a number of things, but to me they are the 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 quintessential CGI sort of digital mm. enhancement stuff. So the guy who came was named Scott Farrar, and he's one of the original magicians. I call him a magician. It's totally. just not even a human being at that point. Totally. And so he's one of the original guys, and he came to basically be the consultant to our movie and just see, you know, how it was going to work mm. um, logistically with the company. And then he decided to stay on. So he was on set for one or two days pre-production and fell in love with this movie and fell in love with what we were doing. And really, he said, fell in love with the, for lack of a better term, sort of like the scrappiness that we had in our movie. We were under budget and under timed and all those things. And he said, it really feels like you guys are making one of the movies that we originally started with, that like Star Wars was a movie that totally. everybody it's was like, an what? Movie. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. what? Yeah. So he stays on. And to your point, this is the guy who, at lunch, I may tell a story about being on set or something, and he's like, yeah, you know, I was the original. I was operating the camera on the first Imperial ship shot at the opening <laughs> of Star Wars. And I was like, oh, God. And you just start crying, and you run out of the room. <laughs> and crying. then when we were talking about designing the creatures, he's like, you know, one of the important things when we were doing the kitchen scene with the raptors in Jurassic Park, and I was like, what? Like, you designed the raptor? Oh, my God. So... You just had this unbelievable guiding hand. And again, to that point of success does not lead to Mm. ease of life. Success is (laughs) leads to, I'm saying you can, you can have it not lead to ease of life. You can keep challenging yourself Mm -hmm. to that point. This guy has literally designed pretty much anything you can imagine. Yeah. And when it came to this creature, he treated it like he had never done anything. And, so he comes into my trailer. Yeah. yeah, and he comes into my trailer and he says, do you know how these creatures walk? And I said, yeah. And he said, can you get on the ground and do it? And I said, <laughs> yeah. Whoa, cool. And so he filmed me doing that and I thought that was a prank. But um, yeah. <laughs> but then he said, so where do these, where do these creatures come from? Mm-hmm. And I said, well, actually I wanted them to be this perfect evolution that wherever they're from, if there aren't humans there to disrupt their ecosystem, then it would be pure evolution. And what pure evolution would be is like, you know, if a turtle comes out of the water and it gets eaten, then the next turtle that comes out has a spike growing out of it. And it's just everything becomes bigger and stronger from the gotcha. thing before it. Mm-hmm. So this would be the highest level of evolution. They wouldn't have light on their planet. So that's why they can't see. They don't mm-hmm. need it. So they actually were evolved out. That's why they're blind. And so they picked up hearing super, you know, the um, mm. And he loved that. And you saw that, like, again, the guy who had done everything was getting down to the nitty gritty. He yeah, didn't ask me cool. once what I thought color they were, what how they walked or whatever. Those were all conversations that came later. He wanted to know why. Why are you telling this story? Ah, why cool. is this interesting to you? And that was just, the why again, it so all important. goes back to Brown and NTI. It felt mm-hmm. like I was back in that summer camp vibe of just, yeah, cool. you know, no rules, just 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 pure play push, yeah play and yeah. push it and challenge it and 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 fail and do yeah. it again you know but it, i mean it also comes back to the the um does it tie into the, like the responsibility thing for like when somebody is telling the story about like yeah i was doing the shot on star wars or whatever mm-hmm. and you're crying like is that <laughs> that 
I cry at everything. Do you so. feel, well, of course. Do you feel like that heightens the, like that gets you out of your comfort zone, like, right? Like that, Oh God, that's yeah. the intimidation that yeah. is inspiring and that is. That's what the whole movie was. I mean, again, mm. I had never done a studio movie. I'd never done visual effects. I'd never directed my wife. I had never done yeah. a movie that had no dialogue. So the whole thing was completely and totally so terrifying. Posts. But yeah. I was like, I'm going in both feet and let's just yeah. see where it goes. This is a high wire act and by property, a high wire act is a wonderful success if you get to the other side. And if not, it's actually the worst case scenario. There's just nothing but bad news Ugh. if you don't make it across. You know, so yeah. I wanted to huh. kind of push that and, and it was terrifying. But again, I was so lucky to find that NTI vibe, that brown vibe again in a group mm. of people, which to be really honest, I wasn't expecting. I thought, you know, it's a studio movie. People have mm -hmm. done this a hundred times. They don't want to care like you care. Mm. And I was totally wrong. So cool. And that's where your choices lead you. Like you want everything to, you want everything. It's safe to say to be like the summer camp, like like totally. the, that totally. energy of of play of risk and fail and risk again exactly, and like yeah. all of uh, play and all yeah. of that. Totally. Um, before I, we have to gush about Emily just for please. Oh frick. Okay. Um, I've never heard someone say oh frick. That you was good. said. <laughs> this is a, this is a clean podcast. I love it. Yeah. I already said bullshit. I'm sorry. Uh, oh yeah yeah yeah. We'll Mark it, Jamie, we'll have to flag it. Um, you said that, you know, directing her for the first time. Like mm -hmm. what, I just want to know, what did you learn from her, mm -hmm. but also like about working with her in a totally new context? One of my favorite stories of this movie is a week before we started shooting, I went in to find my editing bay. We were looking at different places to edit the movie. And... I went to this awesome place, and where is 1619 here in New York? And mm. who was editing there was Rob Marshall, and he was editing Mary, Mary Poppins. Poppins. Uh. And so I went uh. down and said hi to him, and I said, I'm going to start editing. He said, oh, I'm so excited for you. He's the nicest human being mm -hmm. on earth. One of my favorite people I have ever met or will <laughs> ever meet. And he said, um, when do you guys shoot? And I said, in a week. And he said, oh, you'll see. And I said, I know. I love her so much. And he went, nope, you'll see. And I said, I know I'm her biggest fan. He said, no. <laughs> Not until you're in the room when she does what she does will you know why she's so good. Totally. And I thought, whoa. Uh -huh. I had never thought of that because, of course, I've only seen her on screen. I've never really gotten to witness her do mm, her thing. Like on set. Yeah. yeah. It's like when you go to set, it's, you know, mm. you're there for a day or two days and you don't really see her do the real work or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I think it was like day three or four, we did the bathtub scene. Oh, wow. Yeah. And... She, you know, she won't say it because she's too humble. So I'll tell her you, it, it <laughs> yes. was it was one take. That was one take, and that was you didn't the do any most... other. You didn't do any other takes. No, we did coverage of the scene to build it, but uh -huh. the real emotional, not to give it away, but like the emotional mm. explosion that she has yeah. was one take because she's that good. She she was like terror, mm. um, not being able to speak, having an alien come up the stairs, mm -hmm. uh, being pregnant and giving birth at the same time. Like all these things. Physical she can, agony. She can take it all and just go boom and oh. make magic of it in one second. So she does this huge scream, uh, you know, the the big moment. Mm. And you can hear on dailies, there is dead silence in the room. I mean, the air left the room. The crew couldn't speak. No one was moving. So to break the tension, I said, uh, that's lunch. And you can hear it on dailies. That's, uh, that's and this so is fun. what makes her the best actress. So she does this incredible performance. I say that's lunch. And again, on dailies, you can hear she goes, um, she goes from screaming, crying and the whole thing. And then goes, yeah, by the way, what is for lunch? Is it fajitas? Oh I heard it was fajitas. God. And she just like snapped out of it. And I just thought, uh, I will never be able to do that. That is what you are able to harness and your talent level. And the thing I'll tell you about what I learned about her is it, it was basically things I always had a hunch about just watching her performances. Mm. But the, the crazy thing about this is I never asked her to do the role. When I was oh, rewriting mm -hmm. the script, I wrote this role for her. Okay. I, 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 there was only one person I could write the, as the mother of my children, as somebody right. that I would go through any experience in, on earth with, it was her. So I wrote it with her in mind. She was doing that small indie called Mary Poppins. She was, um, <laughs> she had just had a baby. And so I thought mm -hmm. she'll never do this because there's a lot going on. The reason why I was so scared to ask her was twofold. Yes, I was afraid she'd say no. And that would make a very awkward dinner conversation. Oh, no. <laughs> but it was really that she would say, yes, I'll do it for you because she's that type of person. She would, oh, it was like she, a favor. Or yeah, something. she knew mm. that it was a big moment in my career. She knew that I was taking a big swing. Mm. And I have been sitting next to her for the last 10 years mm -hmm. of every time she signs onto a project. And I witnessed the 
there is no one with more class. There is no one with better taste. There is no one with more dedication to a project that when she locks in, she locks in and she gives her whole self to that project. And so I didn't want the first time that she was like, well, I didn't really love the script, but I did it for my husband. I didn't want that to be my movie. So I never asked her. So we're flying to LA. I'm, she's going to do some press thing and I was going to pitch Paramount what I wanted to do. And she said, you know, you're done with the script. Can I read it? She had already recommended a friend of hers and we were kind of in beginning talks with a friend of hers. And I said, yeah, yeah, go ahead and read the script. So I went back to watching Ant-Man or whatever. (laughs) And she is reading the script and she finishes it and she's gray. It looks like she's going to vomit. And so I am legitimately reaching for a barf bag. And she says, she says, you, um, you can't let anyone do this movie. And I was like kind of perplexing how she said it. So it was like a romantic comedy. Like she was trying to pro- like propose to me. And I was like, what are you saying? And she's like, will you let me do this role? <laughs> oh, she's and asked. I yeah. just screamed yes <laughs> on, a, on a commercial flight to LA. Um, I'm surprised we didn't emergency land in San Antonio or something. Right. But it was the moment where I knew that this could be something special because wow. I had her of her own choice, of her own volition, she, she chose to do this. Yeah. And she she made it, she said it was the thing she really wanted to do and she's never seen anything like this and it's the mm. scariest role she's ever played and all mm. these different things. And so all my working together was started from that moment. I just said, we got to treat this movie like we treat our marriage, honesty at all costs, right? So ah. let's walk through the script. Is there any line? Is there any scene? Is there anything that you'd change? Things you want out, things you need to think I need to put in. Mm. And then I stood in the living room almost every night and directed her through every single shot because, I, like I said, I already knew like exactly what I wanted to do. directing in the living room. Just cool. taking her through everything. And, and by the time we came on set, we had already done the work. So I, I really directed gotcha. her long before we got on set. And mm-hmm. she... And I collaborated long before we got on set. And she's just, you know, she's the best of the best. That's just, she's that's just how it is. Yeah. Totally. We could, I could absolutely spend another hour talking about her. <laughs> I really, I was saying this to a friend the other day, like Emily Blunt for me, she's, she's one of my favorite. I have lots of favorite actresses. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say actresses. And like very few of them, you hold them in the highest regard, mm-hmm. but then you still, you go see their next movie and they still blow you away. Yes. And they're still yeah, exceeding your expectations. I totally agree. I and totally when you agree. look at like, she's a bona fide action star, mm-hmm. and then she's a bona fide dramatic star, and then she's like, this year alone. I mean, her performance in Quiet Place is so sensational. Thank you. Mary Poppins is about as opposite as you can get. Uh, literally, I, I said, <laughs> is there ever been a year where people can show the two ends of the spectrum like that? I mean, totally, what a it's range, like you know, spread the wealth. Yeah, you know exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> but both times I'm sitting in the theater, like. I worship her, but I still am – she's I, exceeding. I totally that. agree. I, I remember being the biggest fan of hers long before we met, which was probably really awkward for her when we met because I was like, oh, my God, I think you're my favorite <laughs> actress. But I had seen her obviously in Devil Wears Prada, but yeah. I saw um, My Summer of Love. And that was such a good performance, I forgot it was her. So I talked oh. to her about this movie, My mm-hmm. Summer of Love, and she was like, yeah, I'm in it. And I was like, oh, my God, you Wait, were what? in it. <laughs> oh, so it was it, – I've that, not seen Summer of Love. Oh, you'll love it. Yeah. It's really good. Is this it's, what she won the Golden Globe for? No, she won oh. the Golden Globe for this – I think it was a TV movie called Gideon's Daughter. But, right. Um, no, uh, Pavel uh, Pavlikovsky was oh. the director, and <laughs> as anyone can tell you, he's as good as it gets. And so mm-hmm. it's this – beautiful movie, small indie that I saw a long time ago. But then you watch when we first met, three weeks into us dating, she was like, will you come see this movie? Mm. Uh, you know, they're they're showing me a cut of it and I'm nervous to see it. And I said, oh, okay, great. And so I go and it was young Victoria. And I was like, oh, oh God. I remember sitting in the theater while they're screening this and I just went, I wonder who she's going to date next because the, <laughs> the, 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 like, the performance was so good that I was like, okay, so she's probably going to win an Oscar for this. And then, <laughs> right. like, does she go to Ryan Gosling or is it like, is it like a Chris Evans thing? Like, who, right, right. who is she? Because it certainly is not going to so be funny. me after this. Um, <laughs> I was the stepping stone to get to the better guy. And, uh, and it really is that thing that I'm blown away, that every level time, blown away every time. Every time. Every time. Oh, let's just make this the Emily Blunt fan podcast. I know. Great. Another hour. Until Emily. Until we can, which we could totally do. Well, we have to wrap up. Are there any, do you have any, you have covered, really, this is wonderful. I rambled. The advice, like a, the rambling is, is phenomenal. It's like really perfect. Like an old rack and tour by a fire. I'm very sorry. <laughs> yes. Yes. The fire. Uh, do you have any like parting words of, of wisdom? You covered, audi- I love that we've said about auditions. Mm-hmm. We, I really like dwelling on the kind of early career stuff. Maybe like what? What is next? 
Is anything um, going to change in your in your artistic philosophy? Well, I mean, it, it, it's it's really more about going back to that well of purity, which is mm. as hard as it is, and I know it's hard. And again, I I don't know. I had I had like three years of hard working to be, you know, waiting tables and all that stuff. And mm-hmm. I know so many people have had so much longer. Yeah. Um, but I would say, remember to keep coming back to why you got started in the first place. Mm-hmm. And it's hard. I'm not saying it's not hard because you're like, yeah, but also like I'm paying for my rent and yeah. or paying remember. for my kids. or Yeah. And it's it's all that is designed to make you feel anxious so that there is some control balance here. Mm. And I think if you keep removing that, you go into the audition, like Ed Harris said. Mm-hmm. When you remove all those things, no matter if you're you know, worried about paying for health insurance or paying for your rent or impressing you know, some lover, it's like you go in there, put that all away and just go, no, no, no I'm gonna step in this room because one day a long time ago, I fell in love with it and I'm just gonna mm. do that again. You know, And uh. you put it all aside and it'll all come back to you. Don't worry, as soon as you leave that audition, it'll be like, oh yeah, but I do need to pay my rent. Yeah. <laughs> but just remember why you're doing what you're doing because it's it's so much work and such a huge sacrifice to go for it. And so don't waste it. You know, if you're going for mm-hmm. it, you're already in there. You're already doing don't the hard work. It. So don't waste it. You know, yeah. like you go, go, go all the way and make sure you, you really love it. Yeah. And that taking responsibility, it's like a taking ownership of Exactly. Yeah. 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 And no one, no one will tell you it's easy for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I said, I want a lottery ticket. So when people ask me like, my son or daughter wants to get into mm. acting. What do you think? And I was like, I am the worst person to ask because I got shot out of a cannon. But um, <laughs> it, it, th- that is the advice, which is like, do they really, really love it? Do they? Because yeah. it's like what I learned at NTI. If, if you if you love it enough, you'll be willing to do all that hard work. Otherwise, that hard work gets it. really annoying really fast. Where you're yeah. like, wait, what? Like, I don't I don't have money to pay my rent. This is a joke. I got to get right. out of here. And then right. you stop acting or directing or writing or whatever, and that's fine. Right. But if you're going to stick with it and put yourself through all that torture, then mm-hmm. at least enjoy it and shine that light when you step up, you know? Mm-hmm. Shine the light when people are looking. That's sort of the, the deal. Oh, genius. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Genius. This was wonderful. This was amazing. In the Envelope, an awards podcast, is recorded at Lotus Productions, Hyperbolic Audio, and Big Yellow Duck in New York City, and Soundbox LA, Mark Grau Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Like, rate, subscribe, tell your friends, and follow us on Twitter at In the Envelope. Thanks, as always, to producer, editor, and all-around podcast extraordinaire, Jamie Muffet, and thank you to the team at Backstage the most trusted name in casting. That's Peter Rappaport, Rowan al Francis Ramos, Caitlin Watkins, Lauren Rout, Mark Stinson, and especially Casey Howe. For more awards and industry coverage, head over to Backstage.com. Thank you for listening. Tune in next time for another glimpse in the envelope. Envelope.